السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد uh, my beloved brother and most respected elders, mothers and sisters, um, Alhamdulillah, we reached the part of the seerah last week where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married our mother, Khadija Radiallahu Tabaraka Wa Ta'ala Anha. And we said last week that uh, Khadija Radiallahu Anha proved to be the love of his life. Um, no one else would, would compare. Um, although later on he, his, he had younger wives and Aisha radiallahu anha was, was very young and a daughter of one of his very close friends um, and even she used to get jealous of the lady who had already passed away many years ago um, and this is for a few reasons uh, Muslims the purpose of the seerah is that you derive lessons from it and adjust your lives to it Otherwise, it's just rhetoric. So one of the things we all need to learn from the Prophet wasallam is wafa, uh, is loyalty and devotion. So these are, these are parts of the loyalties of the Prophet wasallam to our mother Khadija radiallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala anha. First of all, um, we know from historical records that Khadija radiallahu anha was older than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who can tell me the age? So the, the famous one is that she was 40 and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 25. And this is the narration of Al-Waqidi. And um, there are other narrations from Ibn Ishaq and Al-Bayhaqi and others who put her age at 28. But for some reason, Al-Waqidi's narration has become famous because it's often quoted. But so far as um, uh, credibility is concerned, you know, levels of acceptance, Ibn Ishaq ranks higher than Al-Waqidi. So the Rajih, at least to us, is that she was probably in her 28th year. Although the famous one has become that she is 40. And then if you look at it physiologically, uh, she radiallahu anha, at the very least, at the very least, bore six children for the Prophet sallallahu So his children from our mother Khadija radiallahu anha was Zainab, Ruqay, so Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum and Fatima from the daughters, and Qasim and Abdullah, and at the very least, that's, have I counted right, Sheikh? That's six. And other scholars say it is possibly eight, because there's another name called Tayyib and uh, Tahir, uh, although the scholars say that these two are the nicknames of the same Abdullah. Tayyib and Tahir are the nicknames of Abdullah. So Qasim was born earlier on, and his kunya, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is Abu al-Qasim. You know, Arabs give a title of respect. Um, they prefer not to call you by your name, and uh, it's, it's a good thing for us to learn uh, you know, to give respect to, to one another. So they used to say Abu al-Qasim, and that was his kunya. Um, so that's his son. And then Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima radiallahu anha. And then Abdullah was born last. So with regards to um, Qasim, they say, he, they say, ala ikhtilafi ahli al-ilm, that he grew to the level where you could sit him on a horse. So five, six, and then died. 
And others say, no, he died, uh, you know, at a toddler age. But we know that Abdullah died uh, in infancy. Um, and subhanallah, Allah Rabbul Izzat did not allow any male progeny to be left after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the hikmah is self-evident. First of all, our father Ibrahim Alayhi Salam made dua that let prophethood continue from my progeny. So if the progeny of the Prophet continued, prophethood would have had to continue. And remember, subhanAllah, on the other side what happened? Because there are two sides, yeah? There's the side of Ismail and the side of Ishaq as the children of Ibrahim. What's the last on the chain of, of Ishaq? Isa alayhi salam. And he didn't get married and his chain finished. And then our prophets, there's no male uh, progeny, so the chain finished. And this is out of the hikmah of the Dhul Arsh al Majid and Fa'alul Lima Yurid. Now that the Prophet وسلم, has left the world and he has no male progeny, there was only one left was Fatima radiallahu anha. And you see what people have done to the lineage from a female side. You know, lifted them to the levels of, uh, you know, ab above level of prophethood for some. Uh, my Allah protect one and all. Um, and had a male progeny been left behind, it, you know, huge problems could have come out of it. I mean, huge uh, tests for some, so far as Aqidah is concerned. You know, out of love and devotion, they would have done um, really strange things. So, but this is the, this is the hikmah of the Dhul Arsh al-Majid and Fa'alul Lima Yurid. So, if you look at the age of our mother Khadija radiallahu anha, and you consider that she got married at 40 and then had six or eight kids, it's, it becomes unfeasible, especially for, for the women of the desert and the women, you know, from Arab descent. Uh, what is accepted or renowned is that Arab women used to mature early. So you see from our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, age of maturity is relatively young. She got married at the age of uh, nine. But... Uh, so, you know, that also means is that they will reach uh, old age at a faster level, you know, where they cannot reproduce. Um, so, putting those two together, 28 seems a more feasible age, and then it is backed by more calitable scholars. Um, so, I hope that has added um, some value into, uh, into the discussion tonight. So we were talking about the wafa of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, his sense of loyal repayment of kindness. Um, even after she died, so, so long as she was alive, the Prophet never remarried. Never married anyone else, although polygamy was the norm. Like amidst the, amidst the Arabs and for centuries amidst well, most people, polygamy was the norm. They used to marry one, two, three, four, five, and uh, whatever they could afford and, and whatever they liked. Um, but the Prophet wasallam never married so long as Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha was, was alive. And even after she died, um, if... A lady that used to visit the house when she was alive used to come into the house. The Prophet used to, you know, his, uh, his demeanor used to change. You could trace the pain of missing someone on his face. And the wives used to see it. Like Khadij, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha was very sensitive to this. Like, you know, uh, she used to pick it up and get upset about it as well. Uh, and she used to come with her own examples, you know. Uh, to try to persuade the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you have you know, a younger wife uh, uh, so don't think about that or don't reminisce about that or, or why are you thinking about that you know um, and once someone came knock the door subhanallah knock the door and the knock was like the knocking of Khadija and the Prophet Sallallahu face changed and he said Khadija used to knock like that. Um, like these are, these are very delicate details for, you know, men are not interested in that, but how do you knock, you know, just come inside, you know. <laughs> uh, but to kind of pick that up and have it in the memory bank and be able to uh, draw to it and say that. And then even in the latter days, 
you know, long, this is in Medina, when he used to sacrifice animals, he used to send meat to her relatives. Khadija has gone long from the picture. And this is, this is Wafa. You know, someone you have a relationship with, someone you have spent time with, and I mean, you know, religiously bound relationships. Uh, don't just chuck it uh, in the wind, uh, value it, honor it. Uh, and she, radiallahu anha, was very devout to him. Uh, and, it, and subhanallah, from his wafa is the name of our, uh, you know, uh, Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know who he named her after? This is shocking. He named her after his mother-in-law. You know, because normally mother-in-laws are not... You know, fihi <laughs> kalam. But for, for the son-in-law, because naming is his right, to say, I want to name, not after my mother, because it could have been Amina, I want to name after your mother who has died. A huge uh, level of of devotion, and obviously she sacrificed uh, her, her everything for him. Um, and subhanallah, when the days of difficulty came, and we will study this uh, in her life, radiallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala anha. So lessons to take from this, um, a few very important lessons. I hope you don't get bored of the lessons, because the lessons are important. We, ha we have to change, uh, dear ones. Number one, notice that our mother Khadija was previously married. And the scholars say she was married twice before the Prophet Her first husband was Atiq ibn Aid al-Makhzumi. Um, and the scholars differ as with regards to whether he died or whether they, the relationship ended, as in the marriage ended. Um, but more of the scholars are of the opinion that he died. And from that, she had one child, uh, a young girl by the name of Hind. Ahmad Khadija had a child from. And then she remarried uh, to Abu Hala at Tamimi. And from that, she had two children. And in the first instance, her daughter's name is Hind. In the second marriage, her son's name is Hind. And Hala is the name of her daughter. And some say the other way around because, uh, you know, he's Abu Hala. So therefore, the kunya must be based on the name of the son. Um, and the scholars differ uh, with regards to this. But alhamdulillah, um, then the Prophet wasallam married her. <coughs> Today, because, you know, although we profess Islam, but at times, Islam, you know, just stops at the throat and it doesn't go much, much deeper than that. Then cultures come in. And in certain cultures, women that are previously married, uh, you know, unfortunately, nothing to do with the faith or with the deen or with the religion. Uh, it has a stigma associated with, uh, you know, that she's uh, previously married, um, you know, um, it, it, uh, why don't you marry someone who's not married and um, th there's, there's a stigma associated with it, what will people say and, and this and that. And yet, the best two people in our history, the Prophet and Khadija radiallahu anha, it was a case of marrying someone who had previously been married. And had we were to stick to culture, as in, you know, someone whose husband has died or whose husband has, you know, has passed away or who's been divorced, and then you decide, listen, no, hasha lillah, we can't marry this person, what will happen to society? You know, in, in a time where divorce rates are at 40%, uh, and anyone that's been with someone, no, you can't, you, uh, you know, the facade will, will swallow the world. Um, and that is why we must grow the capacity to submit to the wisdom of Allah and His Prophet. That is what Islam and Istislam is. That, you know, we put our feelings and vibes aside. We accept what Allah and His Prophet uh, say with regards to that. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to talk about relationships. 
because you would notice in this life, in this beautiful marriage that lasted some 25 years. So from the time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is 25, it lasted till he became a Prophet at 40. And then from 40, the 10 years in uh, Mecca, it was there. And around the 10th year, she passed away. So, you know, uh, 25 years. If I do problems in maths, just look confused and we'll try to look at it again, inshallah. So, I, I, I want to give some advice in, in this uh, scope, my dear ones. Uh, may Allah bless you. They say a young kid was playing with a ball. And he's kicking the ball, and the ball went inside a cave. And he went inside the cave, and, you know, big roomy uh, thing. Um, and he's looking for the ball, and he heard a noise um, from that side, you know, from in the cave. Um, little young kid, young guy, you know, so he goes, who is it? And he heard, who is it? Who is it? So he goes, oh, stop joking. He goes, oh, stop joking. Oh, stop joking. So he got more annoyed. And then he starts saying abusive stuff. You know, you this and you that, and I'll do this. And he's getting agitated and anxious and frustrated and uh, annoyed. And eventually, he took his ball, and the thing is still talking, you know, <laughs> comes home. Ghadbana uh, asifa, you know, angry, annoyed. So the mom looks at him, you know, a wise woman. Sweetheart, what happened? There was something in the cave. Whatever I said, it copied it, you know. So I said, who was there? And he goes, who was there? And then I go, you know. So the mom realized that this is an echo, you know. So you say, and it's just echoing. So the mom gave a very uh, beautiful advice, which is what I want to share with you. The mom said, had you said good things, you would have heard good things. Can I say that again? Had you said good things, you would have heard good things. Whatever you project, that's what comes back. In Arabic, there's a beautiful one that says, Whatever you sow, that is what you will reap. Um, if you are someone that projects positivity, confidence, happiness, positivity, confidence, happiness, joy comes back. If you are a... I think kids will understand this word. If you're a dementor, you know, from the Harry Potter things, that thing that sucks away all positive energy, uh, a Debbie Downer, a party pooper, you know, that type of person. Uh, doesn't matter where I put you, uh, you suck the life out of it. I'll put you in a happy house, the house becomes hell. I put you in a happy class, the class turns out hell. I put you in a happy school, the school turns out hell. Um, it's you. So project goodness. And that comes from a place of confidence. You know, if you are insecure, unconfident, uh, then every situation you are reading it with bloody lenses. You know, as in red, ugly lenses. Every situation looks like a horror movie to you. You know, a kid talks, a kid smiles. I, I had a case, a child smiled at a teacher and he goes, uh, she, uh, he's showing me attitude. Sweetheart, what did he do? He smiled. It's not, it's not, the, the, the lens is that, you know, what you're projecting is wrong. So that's the first one. Project goodness, project confidence. And the Prophet wasallam, in the most difficult of situations, and like for example, Khandaq was very difficult. The whole of Arabia was standing over the trench waiting to come and annihilate them. Everyone's panicking, everyone's nervous, and Muslims are trying to dig a trench. So in the middle of a trench, trench is a hard thing to dig in itself. If you don't believe me, go and dig a swimming pool in the back here. So trench, it's a problem. But now, in the middle of this trench, a boulder comes. Another problem, big, you know, big rock. How are you going to move that? So you would expect people to, 
give up, cry, sit in the corner, you know, do that. So the Prophet وسلم, came, smacked it, and a light shuddered like that through it, and he says, Allahu Akbar, the palaces of Rome. Do you see the positivity? Like you're on the verge of annihilation, an army is there to destroy you, you are hardly able to protect the city, and you are giving the vision, we will conquer the palaces of Rome. Like, do you understand? It's what you project. So, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, at a family level, um, at a house level, at a job level, at a relation, because unfortunately we live in a time where relationship skills are not taught in school. In the past, you know, in the time where there was no schools, these things were very big. You were taught as a child how to behave to uncle and auntie and husband and wife and what is acceptable and what is not. And parents pre uh, prepared you from a young age. And by the time you ended up at the stage of responsibility, you were ready, you were trained, you were rehearsed, uh, you were conditioned. Uh, but now, most of your time is spent trying to become literate and numerate, and then you end up in a marriage relationship and... Uh, or, uh, you know, relationship, we have to manage families and this and that, and um, it's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. So the first one, um, please, the world responds only to the way what you project. If you project, trust me, go do this tomorrow on the street. Just smile at people. They'll have to smile. What's he going to do? Frown at you when you smile? Of course he's not. He has to smile. And... Um, these days, like if I, if I wear, if I wear uh, this outside, I deliberately go out of my way and smile and talk to people, you know, because I don't want them to associate uh, an angry person with this, because that's already associated with these things, you know. Um, so I, I was in Melbourne just a, a, weekend, a weekend ago, um, and I, I was in the elevator, and I have my full, uh, you know, this on in the bish, then, uh, and I got in from the ground level. Next level, uh, a group of people jumped in, you know, came in. And when they saw me, I, I saw the eyes, you know. I, like, what's this doing in Hyatt, you know? So, uh, so I told them, I said, is it, is it shocking? And I laughed. I said, is it shocking? Uh, they go, no. And then we had a little uh, happy chat. And by the time I got up, everyone was smiling and laughing. Alhamdulillah, I said to myself that I've left a positive memory with regards to something that they might have been uh, worried or anxious about. So I have realized that I have to get out of my comfort zone and deliberately try to project happiness and joy and confidence. And that's what, what I get. And in the event that I don't, because there are insecure people in the world, you know, th there are those who, uh, who will be very worried and nervous. I don't take that as my problem. Like I said, khalas, the poor person's having a shortcoming. My Allah Rabbul Izza help them over it and, and I move on. May Allah bless one and all, Ya Rabbi. Uh, that's the first one. Second one. Second one. Listen carefully. This is, this is a semi-Afghan proverb, proverb. So if you can open a knot with your hand, don't use your teeth on it. You know, I, I met a brother who was visiting us from, uh, from Africa. And I asked him about another brother. I said, how is he? He goes, he kills flies with machine guns. That's not literal, you know. You, it means, for a little problem, he takes out the big machines, you know. Like, as in little problem he could solve in a discussion, he gets angry and fights and chucks tantrums and, and this and that. Um, so, uh, we don't use that one, because that, that's, that's a, you know, we say if you, if you can open a knot with your hand, don't use your teeth. So, a lot of times you realize the problem is nice and simple. You don't need to make it big and dramatize and sensationalize and demonize and all of that. Khalas, just, it's, it's nice and simple. Just... Um, yeah, just reduce it, don't increase it, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah bless one and all, Ya Rabbi. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had this young family with Khadija radiallahu anha, uh, and he himself stopped traveling. Like he wouldn't go to Rihlat al-Shita'i wa Saif. He used to send people on behalf of his family uh, to go and do the business. Um, and then... And in society, remember when, when Khadija proposed, part of what she said was, you always keep the middle path. You know, because it's a tribal culture. 
So you've got this tribe and this tribe arguing, and it's easy to take sides and get involved, but he was always the peacemaker. Uh, and as the biblical statement goes, blessed are the peacemakers, you know, it's a good people to be. Uh, and now in his marriage, him and his wife, uh, you know, intelligent, wise, accomplished businesswoman, uh, they navigate through the challenges of the tribes and the community with that wisdom uh, of trying to be solution finders. And pe people recognize this. So around the age where he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 25 is married, he lives, now he is 35. How old? 35. Life is good, alhamdulillah, he's got his house, he's got his wife, he's got his kids. In society, he's adored. They call him a sadiq al um, And uh, alhamdulillah ta'ala, kids love him. You know, he usually carries dates in his pockets, gives it to the kids that come to, to greet um, and I talked to you even about his uh, slave yesterday, you know, uh, last time we met, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha, that, you know, even someone that is given to him as a bonds person loves him to the level that doesn't want to leave him. Um, so he enjoyed a great standing amidst the community. And now at the age of 35, something big happened in Mecca. The center of Mecca is the Kaaba. And subhanAllah, it seems to be geographically centered as well. So the Kaaba um, is, is a building. And buildings go through, uh, you know, deterioration. And the Kaaba was going through deterioration. And certain things accelerated the deterioration. One of those was, they say some lady decided she's going to cook near the Kaaba. And understand, it's not gas av ovens, and it's, you know, it's a wood fire. And this is a desert, so everything is very dry. You know, a little spark, and it will catch fire. So a spark fell on the sitar of the Kaaba, on the, on the, you know, on the, on the curtains of the Kaaba. On, on, you know, it's still covered with cloth today, the same. It used to get covered, so it, it, it burnt, and it damaged um, the building, and especially the, you know, what wood there was, until they tried to turn it off. Uh, it, it kind of deteriorated it a little bit. Then to make matters worse, or alternative story, like it could have been the fire or it could have been the flood. A flood came uh, because Makkah's, the Kaaba is between the mountains, yes, yeah? so all of the waters come in, come in this way. Uh, so when it came, a flood came, and they say the flood used to come once every 10 years. Um, it came, it, it kind of uh, deteriorated further to the level where it was unsafe, to use a modern term, yeah? It was unsafe. Uh, so they realized that, listen, we need, to, uh, we need to repair this. The problem, that the houses in Mecca were mud houses. Like they were good at getting mud and you know, plastering, making, making walls. The Kaaba itself was stone built. Like the stones on top of each other. And they didn't have a stone mason. Like it wasn't part of the skill base of Mecca. Um, but they knew this repair had to be made. And on top of that, because understand, uh, the Kaaba is relatively big, so it needs uh, uh, beams for the roof. Uh, and, they, and where are you going to get wood from? You know, uh, around, around Mecca, it's just rock. And you, you, you need uh, good trees and then good cut and then to get kind of, you know, the, uh, the blocks for that. So it so happened that around that time, a stone mason came into Mecca. So that the, the community thought, you know, realized that this is, this is a good opportunity. And then coincidence, subhanallahi biyadihi al-maqadir, that by the coast, a merchant ship had been stranded ashore. You know, it was bashed and belted by the weather, uh, and the waves had chucked it uh, on the shore. Um, and some of the scholars of Sira say, is that Caesar, the emperor, had sent, um, you know, wood beams and marble and, you know, stones for a cathedral to be um, done in, in, in Yemen. But before reaching there, the ship got, uh, you know, damaged and it landed ashore. It couldn't go anywhere. It just pushed ashore. So they can't carry all this weight. So they decided to take it off. And who wants to buy it? The Quraysh heard they can that we'll buy the wood and some of the stones. 
So, so you know, Allah Rabbul Izza prepares. And amidst them was, was the carpenter as well, because the Quraysh have no carpentry skills. So Allah Rabbul Izza prepared everything for them, you know, for the, for the repair. And they collected money to go buy, and they were very particular. Of the monies, they said, we do not want money of, of fahsha. You know, because if, if money is got through gambling, adultery, uh, riba, they were very specific. We don't want that type of money, but give us your purest money, because this is the house of God. So people contributed, and they went and purchased the stuff, bought it, and now they're ready to start building. What's the problem? Huh? No, Hajj will come later. The problem is the Kaaba is not, is not fallen down yet. The Kaaba is still the Kaaba. And every Arab child since birth, it's indoctrinated, ingrained, driven into their heads the majesty of this house. This is the house of Allah. So now they have to come and break the house of Allah to build a new one. And no one dares come near it. And you know why else? Because 30 years that way, the elephant got destroyed. You know, when he tried to damage this house. So what, what do you want? The, the birds to come again? So no one wants to come forward. And subhanAllah, for a few days, there's a snake that comes out and sunbathes around there. And no one wants to, you know, because that's a bad omen. There's a snake there as well, because it means the Lord doesn't want you to come. So Allah Rabbul Izza sent a bird, uh, an eagle or a hawk, and the eagle cam took the snake and went away with it. So they took this as a good omen that the Lord is happy and he's moved the calamity. This is a sign that we can proceed. But even now they're still hesitant. So they, they're looking, everyone's looking, no, no one, no one's going to go do it. So eventually, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, this is the father of Khalid ibn al-Walid, got up and he said, listen, I will go and try. If I am smitten, if something hits me, khalas, understand that this is a no-go area. But if I am not, then join me. So he came, do, you know, did his walk near and around the Kaaba, crying out, Ya Rabb, we don't want to harm, we don't want to damage, we want to build, we, we, we mean well, Ya Rabb, we mean well. And he started carefully knocking down a brick and two, and everyone's waiting, you know, they're, they're waiting, like, when is it coming, you know, what will happen? So, Khal, uh, Walid ibn al-Mughira didn't die. So they go, listen, let's just play the safe, let's wait till tomorrow. If he's still alive at Fajr, then we will help him. Otherwise, you know, it might be a late night attack, you know. So they waited. Next morning, uh, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira came back with his pickaxe, and, he, and then the Meccans joined. And they took the building down, all the time saying, Ya Rabb, we don't want to harm, and we don't, you know. So they took it down to its foundations, until they say they reach the green foundation, there's like green stones under there somewhere. And when it went, then they tried to strike again. A shudder went through the city. They realized that this is it. We're not supposed to go further than this. Then they started to build. And how they built was they designated, because there's four walls around the Kaaba, they designated one wall to one of the major tribes. You know, each tribe has sub-tribes, but one major tribe, they're all from the Quraysh, but you know, each one took a side and they built the house up. So now we reach the stage of the, you know, the building has reached the level where now they want to put the Hajar al-Aswad, back in its place. And the Hajar al-Aswad is in the corner between two uh, walls. So at the very first, will this tribe put it or this tribe put it? You know, at the very least. So the tribe of Mahzum came 
that it's ours, and they're, they're, they're a huge, majestic tribe. It is ours, and we will put it uh, in its place. Um, and the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abd Manafs, said, you know, we are the direct descendants, and, and we are the ones that found Zam. And, you know, they have the honors and accolades. So it, the, the environment got very tense. And in tribal culture, you know, um, it's a tough culture. You support, uh, you support your own, um, doesn't matter what the consequences is. So what happened is that the tribe of Mahzum went quickly and they got a pot of blood, uh, probably camel blood, bought it, put it down, and they dipped their hands into it, swearing that we will fight till the last drop of our bloods, but we will secure the honor of being the people that put the stone back, because for generations people will talk. And, and something to note about uh, Arab mentality. They were very honor-driven. Like prestige and honor meant a lot to them. Money and stuff didn't that much. But, you know, honor to be respected, adored, held in high esteem, kept on a pedestal, praised, uh, very important. So for those of you married to Arabs, you know, this is uh, praise, praise day and night. Everything will be fine, inshallah. Uh, so what happened, uh, and it's not a bad thing, because what it does is it brings out excellence. It takes away being driven by material and money and you know, the, the silliness that the world has come into. A person has no value, no character, no conduct, no, uh, but, but he's got money. And that's it, Every, everyone thinks he, he's, he's wow, but he's not, he's nothing, he's just got money. And another person, you know, he, he is good, he is... Uh, righteous, he is, uh, you know, he's got all the qualities of goodness, but he's poor. Does that take from him? Of course not. Our Prophet وسلم, died and he had very little wealth, but the greatest human that ever lived. So again, we need to change the paradigm to look for goodness of conduct as opposed to uh, bank balances. So when Mahzum did this, the other tribes went and got pots of blood and they did the same. Now even the other two walls joined as well, that now nah, like, uh, we're all equal in this, you know, if you want to fight, we'll all fight. And the tension lasted, and some say a few days, and some say five days. And can you imagine the talks in the houses, like the wives are talking, and uh, oh, who do they, and they were not the type, you know, sweetheart, don't worry about it, it's just a stone, it wasn't that, this is tribal culture, the tribal culture is, don't take a step back, go till the end, you know, you, you were born to die, fight, that, that type of culture, so, um, it's very tense, so eventually one of the elders, one of the wise, you know, because with age comes wisdom, uh, came to the gathering and he said, listen, if we go to war, what will be left in Mecca? Like, we're all family, we're all cousins, all intermarried, all interrelated. Who do we look at? Like, as we walk out, uh, and we've, you've killed the cousin of this and the uncle of that, like, where do we look at? So they all, you know, agreed that it's not the best to go to war. So what to do? So he said, listen, let's take a judge between us, an arbitrator, and we will, so who... Because, you know, everyone is linked to a tribe, so they said, listen, let's just do a random one. The next one that walks in through the gates of the masjid. Um, because they had reached tension-wise to that level that, listen, let's just choose a person to, to decide. Although there is the likelihood that if from whatever tribe you are, you will decide in the favor of that one. So, Allah Rabbul Izzah chose that the person to walk in at this stage is the Prophet And remember his lifestyle, Khadija radiallahu anha said, you always kept the middle path. And now he walks in and automatically the whole society accepts, we are happy with Sadiq al-Amin, we are happy with Sadiq al-Amin. Like, because he is a solution seeker, you know, a peacemaker, uh, one that comes with, uh, with wise solutions. And may Allah Rabbul Izzah make me and you that type of people 
people, instead of putting fire, uh, fuel onto the fire and dramatizing and sensationalizing and uh, blowing things way out of proportion, we can kind of uh, look for solutions and, and reach some khair. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, came. Uh, and he asked what the quarrel was, and they said, this is, this is the situation. So he goes, okay, get me a cloth. So they brought, and, and look at the hikmah of, of, of the Prophet He got a cloth, and he said, spread it out. They spread it out, and he got the stone and put it on the cloth. And he goes, now each tribe hold aside. So they held aside. They lifted it together until it reached the place, and then the Prophet ﷺ pushed it with his hands in its, in its place, and war was averted. Everyone was happy. Honor was shared. Um, Buy-in happened, if you like, uh, and the problem was resolved. Um, and this is the hikmah of the Prophet ﷺ. More importantly, in a, the symbolic uh, view, remember, uh, remember the symbols. Symbols are very important. And people that have the sight can see it. So remember the first symbol, that when idol worship started, Zamzam disappeared. And Zamzam has recently been found again by the, father, by the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ signifying that a change is go coming towards Tawheed and preparation for that. Because Zamzam is associated with Tawheed. It was given as a gift to Ibrahim and Ismail, Muwahids. Uh, it disappeared when shirk and stuff started to come. And now at the time of uh, Abdul Muttalib, it came out again. Uh, you know, Allah brought it back out to them. Uh, and now the Kaaba has been destroyed as like you know, the Kaaba associated with all of that has been done away with. A new, uh, Kaaba has been rebuilt uh, to show a renewal coming. You know, as a, as a symbol, um, the paganism of the old will go. And, uh, and who will be at the forefront and the cornerstone of this? He put it there himself. You know, the cornerstone of this will be this person, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and at this age, he is 35 years old. At this stage, he is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 35 years old. Uh, Inshallah ta'ala, uh, if Allah Rabbul Izzah gives time and respite. Uh, actually, I just want to mention a couple of words about our mother Khadija radiallahu anha. So things that are mentioned about her uh, in the ahadith, so certain things are history in the ahadith. In the ahadith, they say, um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says Jibreel came and he said Khadija is about to enter upon you and she's carrying a platter of food. Aqra' her salam, tell her salam when she comes in. Say salam alaykum to her. From who? Mir rabbiha, from her Lord. And then Jibreel says, wa minni, and say salam to her from me too. And then says, wa bashirha bi baytin fil jannah min qasab and give her the glad tidings of a palace in Jannah made from Qasab. Qasab is a single pearl, like one pearl, a dwelling of Jannah, not, not your little four bedrooms here, you know, the dwelling, dwelling of Jannah, min Qasab. And in that, Jibreel says, there is no, la, I think, la sahaba fihi wa la nasab. There is no, there is no defect, no problem, no, um, no stress, no worry in that place. Because she bore all the stresses of prophethood here. So Allah has promised there's nothing for you on the other side of stresses. You, and this, uh, can you imagine the status of a lady to have reached a place where um, not a teacher and not a, a, a minister and not a prime minister and not a king and, and not a prophet, but Allah sends Jibreel that go say salam to Khadija. Like status, how does anyone compare to that? Um, and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a hadith, uh, bi sanadin sahih, says, um, 
afdal nisa ahl al jannati khadijah bint khuwailid the most um, the best of the of the women of jannah is khadijah um, wa fatima and and who's fatima her daughter because and this is part of her excellence uh, that not only was she amazing she brought up someone as you know as good like she's still one of the greatest of jannah like even her daughter um wa fatimatu bintu muhammad wa asiyatu imra'atu fir'aun and asiya the wife of the pharaoh uh, and for those of you who don't know this lady um subhanallah she was the wife of the most corrupt individual in human history a person that declared ana rabbukum al-a'la i am your lord most high and a tyrant you know who used to punish and torture and put peop- people in burning fuel and and she she knew all that yet still she believed in her lord like she knew the azab coming the punishment coming torture coming so then they say the pharaoh had her tied you know uh, force stretched out with a boulder on her chest and some scholars say and the horses were ordered to drive away um, and there she cries out rabbi bini li indaka baitan fil jannah o lord make for me a house by yourself in jannah وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ And save me from the Pharaoh and his deeds and save me from the oppressive, oppressive people. So they say although the boulder was on her and they used to beat her, she was just there smiling. She, you know, Allah had protected her from, um, from their difficulties. Uh, but, but faith like that. So this is Asiya, the wife of the Pharaoh. وَمَرْيَمْ إِبْنَةُ عِمْرَانِ And Maryam the daughter of Imran, who is the mother of Isa alayhi salam. And in another hadith, subhanallah, uh, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kamula min al-rijali kathir. Many men have reached a level of, uh, I, I use this hesitantly, enlightenment. You know, but, uh, you know, accomplishment. They have reached a level where a lot of goodness has gathered in one person, you know, uh, faith and piety and character and decency and knowledge. It has, it rarely does it happen. It come, so, for example, all the prophets, there was 124,000 of them, they, they, are, they are complete individuals. But he says, وَلَمْ يَكْمُلْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا But from the women, no one reached this level of accomplishment except for Maryam ibn Imran. Maryam, the daughter of Imran. And Allah Rabbul Izzah with regards to her says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَّرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ O Mary, verily Allah has chosen thee and purified thee and chosen thee above the women of all nations. As such to us, she ranks the highest. And this is... This is the honor that Muhammad gives to the mother of Isa alayhi salam. And the Lord gives to a righteous servant. Uh, and would that the world were to see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, um, a heart like that. And then the second one, Asiya, Imra'atu Fir'aun. And the hadith stops there and then goes, and the superiority of Aisha over other women is the same superiority of delicacy over normal food. So, uh, and, and, and in the ahadith, the Prophet at times mentions different people. This doesn't mean that Khadija and Fatima are still not, you know, not great. So in other ahadith, their names are mentioned. Uh, but I wanted to show the significance the Rasul gives to people that are not even in his ummah. Like as in Asiya and uh, Maryam radiallahu anha. And for my sisters who are, who are here tonight, um, uh, if there's a role model you seek, those are good role models to have. They're good role models to have. Uh, you know, people of whom the Lord is pleased. And everyone else's mention stays for 15 minutes of fame and then it disappears. Um, 
the ones that Allah Rabbul Izza honored will go through time and space. Now, whether uh, Maryam died, you know, the time of Isa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam was 600, six and a bit years before the Prophet sallallahu from that time to this time, Allah is honoring her. Um, Asiya is at the time of Musa. Musa alayhi salam was 1300 years before Jesus. So Allah, uh, you know, we still mention her name because when Allah honors, Allah honors, my Allah honor you, Ya Rabb. Uh, for your time and patience, I thank you. فَقُلْتُ مَا قُلْتُ إِنْ تَكُوا حَسَنَةً فَمِنَ اللَّهِ وَإِنْ تَكُوا سَيِّئَةً فَمِنْ نَفْسِ وَالشَّيْطَانِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ